all of our perceptions are unreliable. Every single one of our perceptions. I just wanted to start off with that. Hi, you guys, my wonderful degenerate family. I'm really excited about what I want to talk about. Look, I even have notes and everything, okay? So in the last video that I posted about having started to meditate and how it's made me come to terms with a lot of things that I didn't even know that I was repressing or avoiding, one of the things that became really apparent to me is the unreliability of all our perceptions. And when I came to that realization, it gave me a, a level of peace. And I want to share this with y'all so that if anyone is suffering because they don't have this piece of information and I can offer it and it helps them relieve some of the suffering, that's what I want to do. And there are a lot of things that makes our perceptions unreliable, but I want to talk about two main contributing factors or elements that influences the unreliability of our perceptions, why it matters, what happens if you don't take the time to understand and internalize and accept the unreliability of our perceptions, and how by perceiving its unreliability can we actually see it as something that we can rely on and depend on. And no, this is not a everything's a construct and we're all in the matrix video, even though we totally are in the matrix, okay? I referenced this book in one of my last videos, The Art of Communicating by Thich Nhat Hanh. I just want to read a little excerpt just to get the discussion started. This is called The Suffering of Pride. There is a well-known Vietnamese story about a young couple who suffered deeply because they didn't practice mindful communication. The husband went off to war and left his pregnant wife behind. Three years later, when he was released from the army, his wife came to the village gate to welcome him and brought along their little boy. It was the first time the man had seen his child. When the young couple saw each other, they could not hold back the tears of joy. They were so grateful that the young man had survived and come home. In Vietnam, there is a tradition that when an important event happens, we make an offering on an altar to our ancestors and tell them what has happened. The wife went to the market to buy flowers, fruits, and other provisions for an offering to place on the altar. The father stayed home with his son and tried to persuade the little boy to call him daddy, but the little boy refused. He said, Mr. You aren't my daddy. My daddy is someone else. He used to come and visit us every night. Whenever he came, my mother would talk to him for a long time and cry and cry. When my mother sat down, the man sat down. When my mother lay down, he also lay down. So you are not my daddy. Hearing these words, the young father's heart turned to stone. He could no longer smile. He became silent. When his wife returned, the old man didn't look at her or speak to her anymore. He was very cold. He acted as though he despised her. She didn't understand why and she began to suffer deeply. After the ceremony to make an offering to the ancestors, it's traditional to take the offering from the altar and then the family sits down and enjoys the meal with happiness. But after the young man performed the offering, he didn't do this. He left the house, went to the village, and spent his time in the liquor shop. He got drunk because he couldn't bear his suffering. When the husband came home, it was very late. He did the same thing every evening. He never talked to his wife, never looked at her, never ate at home. The young lady suffered so much, she couldn't bear it. And on the fourth day, she jumped into the river and drowned. The evening after the funeral, the young father and the boy came home. The man lit the kerosene lamp and the little boy shouted, here's my father, and pointed to the shadow of his father on the wall. It turned out that the young woman used to talk to her shadow every night because she missed her husband so much. One day, the little boy said, everyone in the village has a father. Why don't I have one? In order to calm the little boy, she pointed to her shadow that night on the wall and said, there's your father. So of course, when she sat down, the shadow would sit down too. Now the young father understood. His wrong perception had been wiped away, but it was too late. Whew. Okay, so I know that first impression of that story was more like, holy shit, but also it was more of a cautionary tale. Esther Perel gives a great example as to how something like this can show up in a more contemporary, more relatable aspect. Can you imagine that there is this person that is so close to you that actually has a completely different experience of what just happened? And that's very challenging in a relationship because if I feel this way, you must have done this. Otherwise, why am I feeling it? 
It cannot be that I feel so neglected and that you, you think you were being really warm. She addresses one of the contributing elements that really influence why our perceptions are unreliable, and that is emotions. She says, and that's challenging because if I feel this way, you must have done this. So because the experiences of our emotions are so powerful, we intuitively perceive those experiences to be reliable indicators of what is real. But that story illustrates the complete opposite situation. So like, how do we tackle this? Christo offers a parameter that we can use to gauge how to interpret this complicated set of unreliabilities. Right, so we have to kind of think like, what is real? And we think real reality, it's all the same. And in fact, it's not. There's this thing which you believe to be real, which is just really subjective individual reality. And sometimes that rubs up against object, objective physical reality. All right, so there's objective reality and subjective reality. And I feel like to a certain level, that's widely understood. You know, everyone has different perceptions of what happened. Duh, we get that. But what he says is like they rub up against each other. They do like a kind of reality dance and that's how they exist. So Esther Pearl talks about emotions, and that's one of the factors. Jordan Peterson introduces the other element, the other main factor of what we're going to be talking about. Some of you undoubtedly have already experienced what it's like to be possessed by a particularly stupid idea. You know, so maybe you've grown out of one or two of the stupid ideas that possessed you. Or maybe you're possessed by an attraction to someone you can't control, or you can't control your eating behavior, or you... You know, you're a pushover when it comes to interpersonal interactions because you're too agreeable or you fly off the handle and fight and, you know, none of this is really under your control. And so all of those things that manifest themselves, not only in your behaviors, but in your perceptions, your perceptions themselves, you know, they tend to take on embodied form and use you as the vehicle for their activity. Essentially what Dr. Jordan B. Peterson is talking about when he says being possessed by a particularly stupid idea, he's talking about your belief systems. And he's really intentional with his words because he says when you're possessed by an idea, I feel like y'all would be like, what the fuck does that mean? How can an idea have me? I have ideas. So what he means by that is when an idea is presented to you, you then internalize it as your own personal a belief and then you become unwavering from it. It isn't something that other people can contribute to because it's like, no, I'm stuck in this mindset. This is my belief. It is what it is. And stick with me, okay? Stick with me. It gets better, I promise. So Christo, he teaches and coaches a lot of young entrepreneurs and helps them find their value in the marketplace. In this next story, he puts into perspective what Jordan Peterson just tried to explain and it's not not in the way that you're thinking. Somebody I befriended on the internet and I was coaching her and she kept telling me, Chris, I can't seem to bill more for websites than $8,000. So she was hitting her glass ceiling. And I said, you can charge more. She goes, no, you don't understand. I work with influencers and experts and coaches and authors and they just don't value design. I've tried and tried and they just, it's $8,000. So here's the good news about this story is that I coach and teach a lot of people. So I meet this other person, his name, not Benny, but I talk to Benny and Benny does the exact same thing for the exact same market, but Benny charges somewhere between 20 to $50,000. I knew it. I knew it. She was lying to me all this time. So I call up Carrie again. I said, Carrie, you know, I met this gentleman. He does exactly what you do. So he charges way more than you. And she goes, it's not possible. What's his name? What's his website? And she searches on the internet. She looks it up. She goes, dang it. It is exactly the same. So I leave Carrie alone for a little while to think about this. And I told Carrie, Carrie, I've been talking to you for a really long time now. I don't know why it is that you haven't implemented anything that I've taught you so far. I think I'm wasting my time. This is the tough Asian dad love thing going on here. I say to her, if you're not willing to change, I think I need to move on. I, I got to spend time with somebody else and I'm going to teach somebody else. She goes, Chris, please, please don't give up on me. I can do this. So what Carrie does in the very next call is she summons up the courage to ask for more money. Now I'm going to fast forward in the story a little bit. About six months later, 
she told me she already billed more in the six months than she did the entire previous year. So what was different? This is what I asked her, what was different? What changed? She goes, I don't know what you mean. I said, well, did you change your landing page? Did you write new case studies? Did you rebrand? Did you say anything different? She goes, no, nothing's different. I said, no, something is different. Your belief in what is possible has changed. And that's all it takes. I know it's hard for some of you to hear this because I do teach a lot of people how to find their value in the marketplace. But the thing that you need to do is to believe and then do it. That's the secret formula. I love that part. I always love that part. Your belief in what is possible has changed. And before y'all are like, okay, this is just like a chicken soup for the soul kind of story, a feel good story. No, 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 no. There's a little bit more nuance to that. When Carrie's beliefs changed, she didn't even realize it. It was not a part of her awareness. So that's an example of how beliefs possess you and use you as a vehicle. It's also another illustration of how complicated belief systems can be. Just the tip of the iceberg. Esther Perel gives a good example of how this can show up in a more relatable and a more contemporary example. If a date shows up late and we have a history of being left waiting and feeling invisible, we might race immediately to the foregone conclusion of our go-to story that either they are selfish or that we are not worthy or both. And when we hold on to these deep beliefs about who we are and how we think others view us, it prevents us from creating new beliefs about who we can be. So when Esther Perel says, when we hold on to these deep beliefs, that's essentially a nicer way of saying what Jordan Peterson said about when you're possessed by a particularly stupid idea. And the point is, is that when you are stuck in those deep beliefs, it fossilizes you and it prevents growth. This was very clearly portrayed in this one Sex in the City episode. Miranda, she has like the short hair. She recently hooked up with a bartender and he likes her so he met her and her friends it was to like buy them drinks try to get involved with her because he liked her what esther Perel is saying this is something that it would look like there mm, look at you yeah, well if you want good service send a bartender and if you want a good fuck go home with one hello it was funny miranda can i talk to you over there for a second the gods are punishing me for having casual sex. Thank you. One quick question and I'm out of here. Mm -hmm. Why do you hate guys so much? Excuse me? We just met, so I know that ain't all about me. Wait, wait, wait! What? What do you want? I just want to get to know you better. Do me a favor. Can you for one second believe that maybe I'm not some full of shit guy? That maybe I do like you? That maybe the other night was special? Do you think that maybe you can believe that? No. Maybe I've just slept with too many bartenders. Okay, so after seeing Esther Perel's example and that Sex in the City clip, something that y'all could say is that those examples was just of someone being salty. They didn't get over when they did get left behind or kept waiting for a date or whatever. And they're cynical and jaded and I'm not. So I'm not stuck in that place where it prevents growth. Or, no, I know I'm cynical, but knowing that isn't possessing me. It cannot be something that possesses me because I know it and I own it. So I can still grow because I know that I'm jaded and cynical and salty. And I didn't get over that one guy that like left me waiting. Okay, true, fair enough. But another way to see that is also that that could be a story that you're telling yourself, a belief system that you're clinging on to, that you're staying in, that could potentially prevent growth. And if you're like, no, I'm different because I'm self-aware, another way to look at it is also you're preventing your growth because you're justifying your stagnation. And there is a point where having strong personal boundaries crosses a line and becomes having rigid self-righteousness and 
entitlement to having needs be met in your terms. And that is something that I'm going to make another video on, which is like, how do you know if your personal boundaries are ones that are based on internalized ethical morals, or if they're just an example of being self-righteously rigid and unwavering. Anyways, so Chris Doe demonstrates how it's easy to become your own personal echo chamber. So here's how the cycle works, and there's five spokes to this wheel. What you think is what you say, and what you say is what you wind up doing, right? And what you do becomes your behavior. Your behavior becomes your identity. And so it goes on and on and on in a circle. And before you know it, your life has fallen into a groove. And you know how this works on the needle. The longer you play the track, the deeper the groove gets, the harder it is to move the needle from the track. Okay, and your response to that could be, but I'm happy the way that I am. I'm okay that I feel like I'm unworthy because it actually made me fight harder. It makes me work harder. That's why I am at the place that I'm at right now in my job and in my relationships because I fought so hard to get there. And it's because I held on to the belief that I'm not worthy enough. Okay, fair. But that kind of mindset is still one that encapsulates an anti-growth mindset. And if you don't want to change, if you're happy with where you are, your prerogative, just so you know, what that also encompasses is when you aren't growing, seeing growth in others in your life will also essentially be imperceptible to you. So it's going to affect your relationships and every other aspect. Because if you are not willing to accept that that mindset is anti-growth, preventing growth and not about change because you know you in a sense are alienating the other people that are in your lives. And Jordan Peterson breaks it down in a psychoanalytic way where doing this exercise is a kind of mental muscle. So doing it over and over again, it becomes a muscle memory essentially piggybacking off of that chart that Chris Doe just showed us. What's the difference between repressing something and lying to yourself about it? Well, Freud would say often that repression occurs unconsciously, but I really wonder about that. I think that what happens is that something happened or you did something that you don't like and it's bothering you and you could think it through, but you just decide not to. You just don't think it through, so it's left vague and uncertain and, you know, it's fairly emotionally salient, but you just refuse to think it through, and you practice doing that until you've built up a habit of not thinking that through, and then you forget that you've built up the habit, and then it's like it's being repressed unconsciously. But I think that you know, or at least you knew when you first did it. And so, you know, when you meet people who are acting in a twisted and peculiar way, and you ask yourself, uh, they're very manipulative, say, you ask yourself, well, do they know what they're doing? The answer to that could be, well, no. But another answer could be, yeah, but they knew once. They knew when they made the decision to start acting like that. But after they did it a hundred times or so and made it into an automatic routine, well, then they forgot its origin and now it runs autonomously. And so now they don't know, but they did know. I love how Jordan Peterson is like, but they don't know. So anyways, an example of that would be using the Sex and the City clip. Miranda, there was a point where she was like, yo, fuck men, okay? That last relationship was way too hard. It was annoying. Fuck men. They all suck. And then every man after that became a victim of that belief system that she in she started to internalize. So when Steve, that was the bartender that was bringing them the drinks, it's like, why do you hate men so much? Because I know that was not all about me. He was alluding to something like this, where Jordan Peterson is like, they knew at one point they made the decision, but after a while, it's just internalized in her mind. Yeah, men are shit. That's it. End of story. Can you believe this? Nope. It's like, you're not even going to listen to me? No that becomes dangerous. Esther Perel gives two examples of this, of how it can show up in like everyday life, in your relationships, and it's not always just romantic relationships, like professional ones, platonic ones, whatever. This one is called confirmation bias, which is that now that I've decided that you really are a slob and you don't care about whatever I ask you, I look for it. 
I look for it. It's like a radar that is looking to confirm the bias that I have. If I believe you don't care, if I believe I, this doesn't matter, I, ch I, I scan it. And I disregard evidence that proves the opposite. The one time that, and if you say, but I did it yesterday, I said, that's just yesterday, that's one time, that doesn't count because look, da 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 And you know, the whole scoreboard arrives. What she said was, if I believe this, then I look for it. The key word is believe, belief systems. When you are late, according to you, it's because you had circumstances that explain it. It's because you have a busy life. It's because you're an important person. It's because somebody else needed something from you. It's circumstantial. If your partner is late, it's because they are disrespectful. It's because they don't care about you. It's because they don't understand the notion of time. It's because they are selfish. It's because they're narcissistic. You name it. Yours is circumstantial. Theirs is characterological. And so those both are examples of how if you stay stuck in that mindset, this is the perception you're going to project onto everyone else that they also cannot be changing. They also have to be the way that I believe them to be. And that's where the confirmation bias comes in. And in that second example where she says that yours is circumstantial, theirs is characterological, Esther Perel calls it fundamental attribution error. And that is something that I feel like is easier to fall prey to, but less obvious than the whole confirmation bias thing, because it's a judgment. It's a judgment and it's like an immediate interpretation of the situation based on your preconceived notions of what the situation has already been, if that makes sense. So the clips that I showed so far, what was at the forefront was belief systems, but what was also running like a vein through all of those examples was emotions. My point is, is that emotions and belief systems are the two main elements that are the contributing factors as to why our perceptions are unreliable. But it isn't like there's one pillar, emotion, and then another pillar, belief systems, and then what they hold up are your perceptions. It's not that simple. They're not that binary. They're more like one pillar, one solid pillar, but made of all small little pebbles, and one pebble is emotions. This pebble was a belief system, and in this particular situation, this pillar this whole chunk is a belief system. And then scattered around here, there are pebbles of emotions. So it's like your perceptions are an amalgamation of the emotions and the belief systems. The belief systems and the emotions, they are mutually inclusive, meaning one cannot exist without the other. When one happens, the other is also happening. But they're so interrelated, interconnected, intercorrelated that it's not like, oh, it's 50-50. It's like, a dance, okay? Remember the dance, the subjective and the objective reality dance? This is the dance that we're talking about. So that's why it's like tricky. One doesn't come before the other. It's kind of like the chicken or the egg thing, all right? And Jordan Peterson delves into that dance, how complicated it actually can be. How must someone generally act if you're going to be angry at them? They have to be irritating, right? <laughs> you know, they have to provoke you in some way. Well, the mere fact that you perceive what they're doing as irritating or provoking doesn't ensure that anyone else would have thought about it as irritating or provoking, or that that's what they meant, or that that's what's happening. I feel like what he's emphasizing in that particular clip is that when you are in a highly emotional state or a situation where like your belief systems kick in, intentionality matters, but in those situations, the intentionality is too easily overlooked. And I'll use another example. Say there's a group of friends and I feel like there's this one girl who doesn't show up and she's a flake, but the other girl next to me is like, oh yeah, she has like a different schedule. She's busy. Like I'm chilling, whatever. She shows up when she can. I'm upset about it because I'm upset about it. I don't take into account that that friend might not even realize that I perceive it this way because her intentions are more like, I'm sorry, I can't show up to happy hour. I'm working. I'm, I'm busy. I have a different schedule. 
Like, I didn't think it was an issue. I didn't mean to do that. Like, now that I know that it bothers you, I will try to make some dinner dates where it works on my schedule. You know, I don't know if you guys are available for dinner dates, but like, I'll start initiating that. And those intentions are overlooked when you are in a highly emotional state. So Jordan Peterson is like, just because you perceived it that way, it doesn't ensure that that's what's happening, that's what's going on, or that other people would have perceived it that way. So then that's tricky, right? Because like, how do we reconcile that? When I'm angry, what am I just being extra? Like, should I not ever feel angry? Am I overreacting? No, 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 no. Christo offers a parameter to use to try to reconcile this kind of like, okay, so what the fuck do I do with my super intense emotional states then? What he does is he asks the audience, true or false? You get out of life what you put into it. And the audience is like, true, true. So true, you get out of life what you put into it, right? Okay. Well, look at this input output. It seems to make sense. But what I want to do is to interrupt this and insert one critical step that you may not be aware of. And that is interpretation. Input, and depending on how you look at things, determines your output. Just keep in mind those parameters, input, and depending on how you look at things, determines your output. We're going to jump back to the Jordan Peterson lecture because he expands on that. If you're angry, if you have a proclivity towards anger, especially if it's an unthinking proclivity, anything that someone says might irritate you. And it isn't like they say something and you think about it and then you get irritated. It's like you perceive the person as irritating. You know, maybe it's just the way they hold their mouth or something. It, it, it can be very, very subtle. And you might say, well, it's not me, it's you. It's not that I'm irritated by you. It's that you're irritating. And that, you know, that's a very difficult thing to settle because the reality is somewhere between the subjective and the objective, right? It, a lot of arguments that you'll have with people throughout your life are about exactly that. Am I, are you irritating or am I oversensitive? It's like, well, you know, we're gonna hash that out for a good long time before we figure it out. But the point is, is that if you're possessed by an emotional state or a motivational state or an idea or some kind of complex, you'll see the world through its eyes. And then the facts reveal themselves to you through the lens of that particular set of ideas. So he's not saying like, yo, we ain't shit, we're just emotional pieces of shit, human that creates drama because we're emotional. He's just trying to dissect how this kind of love triangle between perception, emotions, and belief systems, how it works. Expanding on that even further, Chris Doe re-examines the flowchart that he showed us incorporating what Jordan Peterson was trying to dissect. So your life really depends on how you look at the world. What do you see? So let's re-examine this same flowchart again. Your input, depending on the interpretation, has an infinite number of outputs, right? So if you want to be angry, you will find a way to be angry. And if you want to feel hurt, you will find a way to feel hurt. I just happen to choose to be happy. That works much better for me. So I've developed a belief system that lifts me up that reminds me that when I fall down, it's okay, and that everything is a work in progress, and I have something to learn. And so before y'all get angry at me or at Christo, I know that when you're depressed, it's not like you choose to be depressed. When you suffer from anxiety, you chose to have anxiety because that was the input you put in, so that's the output you got. That's not what he's saying. What he's trying to emphasize is the agency we have in terms of the belief systems we choose to internalize. That's what he's emphasizing. So his emphasis is, I chose a belief system that reminds me that when I fall down, it's okay and everything is a work in progress. Because at the end of the day, we cannot help how we feel. We can't. Why is that your favorite color? I don't fucking know. I, I like it. Why did your feelings get hurt? My feelings were fine. I don't fucking know. It just hurt my feelings. That's how I feel. I'm scared of the dark. Why? I, I just fucking am. I'm scared of the fucking dark. You cannot help how we feel. All right. Emotions, they are a huge part of perceptions, right? And I feel like Esther Perel gives a great kind of summary punchline about emotions and how we can understand how to handle when you're like, I'm angry. Does that mean like, I'm I'm being extra, what does that mean if that means that it doesn't ensure that that's what everyone else is feeling? And you're allowed to be angry, you're allowed to be pissed, but you're not allowed in the same way to think that your experience therefore is the reality or the truth. 
it is the truth of your experience, but not necessarily the truth of what happens. It's the truth of your experience. And I think that is really important to reiterate because your emotional experiences matter. How you feel in a particular situation, that matters. That's important. It's really telling of what makes you uncomfortable, what makes you happy. It's really telling of who you are as a person. And it should never be denigrated. You know, like if everyone else in the group is chill, but you're like, I'm really uncomfortable. You're uncomfortable, bitch. Like, yeah yes, boo-boo, I got you. Be uncomfortable. That's how you fucking feel, all right? But And we're going to use that friend who is flaky example again. There is a difference between me saying, you never show up and you're always a flake. That's different than saying, I feel like you're never here for me when I want you to be here for me. And I feel like you're always flaking on me. Those are two entirely different things. The way that you're expressing your emotions and how you're communicating that, that matters because you're allowed to be pissed, but you're not allowed to feel like, like your emotions encompass the reality of the situation. It's the reality of your truth, of your experience. But earlier when Jordan Peterson was like, just because you're irritated, it doesn't ensure that everyone else is or that that's what he meant or that that's what's happening. That's really hard to juggle, especially because emotions that's what makes us human, right? Like that's how we relate to each other. We all understand the feeling of happiness, being fearful, excited, angry, resentful. We all understand those feelings even if we don't speak the same language. We still understand those fundamental emotions. And I just wanted to emphasize that because it's not about minimizing, reducing, denigrating, shaming, judging, dismissing, criticizing, questioning, alienating, or invalidating anyone's emotional experiences. You're your emotions are yours and they're real and they're valid. Own them, but don't own them in a way that makes you stuck in a anti-change mindset, okay? And I think because emotional experiences are so powerful and they're such an essential part of the human experience, a lot of people struggle with this because there's so many people that don't understand the interconnectivity, the interrelational dynamics between perception, the emotions, and your belief systems. Because they don't understand that, they intuitively lean towards my emotional experience is a reliable indicator of what is real and what is reality and what is happening. I think at this point, I can make the argument that if we're just taking into account emotions, belief systems, and perceptions, and emotions are something that we cannot control, we cannot help, and that's a big part of what makes up our perceptions, then a big part of our perceptions are also out of our hands. They are not in our control, which would in turn make it unreliable right? Right? But I'm not done yet. I'm not done yet. All right. If y'all are still resisting, Jordan Peterson, Esther Perel, and Christo have all touched on how we have a certain amount of agency over choosing the belief systems we internalize. That being said, if belief systems is one of the corners or whatever of this love triangle thing, even if the other two are not in our control, controlling our belief systems by default will have an influence on the other two, your emotions and the perceptions. Everything we've just discussed, I feel like this is a great way to tie it up, package it up on a bow and a silver platter and serve it to you. Okay, so I love this line from Sean Arker, Acor, TED speaker. The lens through which your brain views the world shapes your reality. Change the lens, change your happiness, change every single outcome at the same time. Right, so I'm going to leave that up there for a little bit because I know that first impressions of that is like, oh, another motivational poster. Positive vibes only, no toxicity, blah, blah, blah. It can very much be perceived that way. However, I think the verbiage is very intentional here also where you change your lens, you change your happiness. It doesn't mean your happiness is better. You can denigrate your happiness because the lens that you chose disrespected your happiness. So your happiness is actually less. If you change your lens, your happiness changes, your motivation changes, your outlook on life changes, the lens in this motivational poster that is not a motivational poster but just very eloquently articulated is the belief systems. If you change your belief systems, you change every single outcome at the same time. That is the takeaway. But this can only happen if you internalize and accept and perceive the unreliability of our perceptions. And that's almost 
being facetious because your emotions are not unreliable, your belief systems are not unreliable, it's really telling of who you are. But in a situation where that story that I started off with, if you're stuck there and if you're not willing to accept that other experiences of the same situation is possible, then you're done. Everyone else is going to grow and you're going to be fossilized, eventually become outdated. So all of this unreliability, how can we see that as something reliable? Think about when a DJ is DJing and they have like a sound bar and it's green and then there's a little yellow section and then there's a red section where if you're redlining that means you're about to blow your speakers like that is not okay you need to turn something down once we are able to see that our perceptions are not entirely reliable we can then attribute that to this meter we could see it as a gauge or like a radar when it's redlining that is a 1000% good indication that you should check in with yourself? Am I just being highly influenced by anger right now because I'm so pissed off? And a lot of the times when I get a text and I'm like, what the, are you fucking kidding me? I want to pop off. I want to clap back. What I've been trying to be better at is I don't even answer. I read it. I recognize how angry I'm feeling. I try to digest it and I won't text back until I've thought about it for a little. Because when you just react, that's not being reflective. When you're reactive, that is exactly like being possessed by that emotional state. It is using you as a vehicle. Because after we pop off, how many times have y'all been like, I was so fucking heated. Like, I did not mean to say that I hope you gain 20 pounds and that your cat gets a yeast infection too. I am so sorry. I didn't mean that. You know, you say that in the heat of the moment and it's really hard to pause when you're in that highly emotional state. So that highly emotional state is almost like redlining. And that's when you have to be like, okay, which knob do I need to turn down? Which system do I need to check? Because this is not my baseline. This is not me. This is an angry version of me in the driver's seat right now. And it's not like the angry version of you is always in the driver's seat 1000% of the time. I mean, we're not even going to get into if that is the case, okay? Because that's like a different rabbit hole. But that is how we can see our unreliable perceptions as something reliable. But we have to first recognize that they are unreliable. So this is a fun exercise exercise that y'all can do right now and it takes into account everything that we've said just just a little bit and it's just for fun just to like see where y'all are at when I saw this for the first time I had so much fun and I know some of you guys have have already seen it because I have featured it on happy hour it's just like a real-time experiment of everything that we kind of touched upon so far what do you see just look at this for a second what do you see just read this in your mind and I'm going to pause that really quick, okay? Cause just read that, read that. Because when I first saw this, I was like, where are you going with this, sir? Sir Christo, I was like, where are you going with this? And most people who read this will feel a little bit angry. And why does this make you angry? Somebody will say, well, that's unfair to women. And some will say that's unfair to men. Because your answer totally depends on where you put the comma. So here we go. We'll read it now with a comma in place. Woman without her man is nothing. And it's, a, it's how a lot of us read this. I did. Now, if we put another comma in here, woman, without her, man is nothing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, thank you. All right, see? So originally, I accidentally didn't trim that clip short enough, but I saw that. And I was like, yo, I'm keeping that because that was what my initial reaction was. When he said that, I was like, oh shit, oh snap. I was like, holy fuck. I was like, okay, you right, you right. I'm so sorry I ever doubted you ever. That was so much fun when I saw it for the first time. Anyways, the story finishes off with a wrong perception can be the cause of a lot of suffering. All of us are subject to misunderstanding. We live with wrong perceptions every day. That's why we have to practice looking deeply into the nature of our perceptions. What Whatever we perceive, we have to ask ourselves, are you sure your perceptions are right? To be safe, 
you have to ask, right? Yay, okay, nice, like I know what to do now. But actually, how the fuck do I do that? How do I ensure my perceptions are right? Because Jordan Peterson said, just because you're angry, it doesn't ensure that like that's what's happening. How do we reconcile that? How do we approach this? Dr. Gabor Mate, he is featured on this podcast. And what he normally does when he's doing talks and presentations is he'll do this exercise that is like a step-by-step how to check yourself when you are in this highly emotional state. And this highly emotional state doesn't even have to be angry or resentful or bitter. It could also be happiness, so excited. I have this new love. He's an asshole, he's a dick, he's cheating on you. No, but I love him so much and like you overlook that shit. Same thing. It's not just the aggressive emotions. It's like even the happy butterflies. You stay in a relationship with someone because you're so in love with them because they make you feel so happy and you overlook that they don't even show up for dinner when they say they're going to. They don't answer your texts. They leave you on red for like three days. They have you paying for everything. No, I love him. He's just like in a hard time right now. And you know, the same thing. So it's not just the negative emotions, which I don't believe there are negative emotions there are just emotions. Anger is not negative. How you act out the anger can be negative or positive, but I don't think that anger in and of itself is a negative emotion. I do not believe that there are negative emotions. There are just emotions. I just wanted to put that out there. What he does, he's featured on Tim Ferriss's podcast. Oh my gosh, I'm gonna have to double check. Dr. Gabor Mate, what he does is this exercise with Tim and it's a real-time step-by-step exercise of checking yourself when you're in a highly emotional state, how that would look like. I asked people to tell me some recent episode when they're upset with somebody with their lives. Uh, and something that they're open to sharing. So it doesn't have to be anything sordid or thing, but just something, you know, whether it's your spouse, partner, the bus driver, I, I don't care who. Sure. A friend. Okay. So are you Is willing to go there? Anything. Okay. It, I can share anything? Just where you were upset with somebody. Okay. Yes. Okay. So what happened? Describe it. What happened? Yeah. All right. There were a number of issues in my home, broken uh, aspects of the home, things that were falling apart or needed to be fixed. Physically. Physically, okay, yeah, right. And I had hired someone to do these things right. while I was gone. Okay, and I came back, and none of them were fixed. Okay, and your emotional reaction was anger, rage, anger. Okay, anything else besides anger? Mm, I think they're close cousins. Frustration. Frustration uh, is frustration is anger. Yeah. Yeah, I was disappointed. Disappointed is sadness. Yeah, it's a different feeling. So I was disappointed uh, in myself also because I started to look at how maybe... Well, disappointed is not so much an emotion as a state of mind. I'm asking what the emotions were. I'm, I'm... What's inside disappointment? Something didn't happen. I wanted it to happen. How do I feel? He's like... Isn't there sadness there? Sure. Yeah, there's sadness. I'm not talking into it. I'm just asking. <laughs> well, I, I suppose I'm... I might be confusing state of mind and states of mind and emotions. Yeah. Since I'm, I'm not sure how to do yeah, it. So I'm, but... I'm looking at the raw emotion. Yeah, sadness. So there's anger and sadness. Those are the emotions. Let's let's go with that. Yeah. Okay. Mm-hmm. So I'm going to ask you a silly question. What were you sad and angry about? Well, I suppose the answer, which is not the right answer I'm expecting, was I was angry that someone had made commitments to me and not fulfilled those commitments. And what uh, that, and, okay, well, that, that's what happened. They had made the commitment and the them, but that doesn't tell me what you were sad or angry about. Look at him smiling. <laughs> What, 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 what does that mean that they didn't fulfill their commitments? Uh, meant that they didn't care about me. They uh-huh. didn't uh, have that they, they didn't, didn't res- respect me. So they didn't care about you and didn't respect you. What kind of person doesn't get cared or respected? I might need a lifeline here. I don't know. Someone who doesn't deserve to be cared for or respected. Exactly. Somebody right. unworthy, right? Sure. Of respect and, and, and care. Mm-hmm. Okay. Now, if there are other people here, which there usually are when I do this exercise, I would ask them, okay, we just listened to uh, Tim tell us about this experience. Are there other reasons why this other person might not have done the work right. that has nothing to do with yep. him or her not caring about Tim or not respecting him? So what other reasons might there be? A million and one. He could be in the hospital. He could be in the His hospital. His part, else? part of our cared one could have been in a car accident. Exactly. He had a, f- a flight delay and got caught on Puerto Rico during a hurricane. I'm, yeah, it, he's got ADHD. Yeah. He, and he can't follow through. Um, he's under stress and he couldn't... Okay, the, okay, now, the, e- the email that I was supposed to send is sitting in drafts and I thought I had sent it, but in fact, he never received it. I mean, And any number of possibilities. Yeah. Now, of all the possibilities that you've just uh, outlined, including that he, they don't care about you or respect you, which is the worst one? The one I 
immediately defaulted to. Right. So let's notice something. A, you, I should say we, because we're all like this, we don't respond to what happens. We respond to our perception of what happens. Right. Okay? That's what the Buddha said. It's with our minds we create the world. So that um, if you'd found out he had ADHD or, or he was stressed, or you, know, you might have been sad for him, but you would not have been angry and you would not have been sad. So first of all, we don't respond to what happens. We respond to our perception of what happens, to our interpretation of what happens. Number one. Number two, of all the possible interpretations, we choose the worst one. Thirdly, what I just said isn't true. We didn't choose it. It's not like you went through all these possibilities <laughs> and you right. said... Was it multiple choice yeah. and I chose option D? Oh, no, he doesn't care about me. He, he doesn't respect me. You didn't do that. Your brain jumped there automatically, right? Mm -hmm. well, the question is why. Ooh, he's like, my question is why. The answer to fit the context of everything we're talking about is to bring back the infamous line because you're possessed by a particularly stupid idea. But there are deeper, complex reasons as to why. And I want to make another video about that too. Okay, I don't know if any of y'all felt a little intimidated when you saw that session because it's like, okay, how do I check myself? And it's like, disappointed is not an emotion, it's a state of mind. Like, what the fuck does that even mean? When I'm feeling disappointed, I'm feeling disappointed. When I'm feeling frustrated, that's frustrating. I didn't know that those were states of mind. It's not like, oh, I know how to check myself. I know how to do it. So it's like, now I'm a master. I know how to do it. The emotions that arise, they're not going to always arise for the same reasons all the time. So the way that you handle them or check them are also going to not be the same. And I think Christo puts this very eloquently and beautifully as to how we can not be intimidated by trying to implement this for the first time or implement it better if we have been trying to check ourselves. First thing that I've learned is that you've got to put in the work to show up every single day to do the best you can with what you have in the time that you have and to be patient. This is a long grinding process and I like to think of it as the infinite game of continuous self-improvement. Yeah, so it's like the first time when I'm in a highly emotional state, that's when I need to check myself. Obviously, it's not going to be easy to do that because when you're fucking pissed off and you're raging, I mean, raise your hand. How many times have you cursed your fucking coffee table to fucking hell, you stupid piece of shit, because you hit your pinky toe on it? The coffee table is just like, I'm just a coffee table, bro. I didn't do anything. And you're like, fuck you. Ow, you fucking die, you piece of shit. You know, and it's like, that's the moment that you're supposed to like, okay, let me count to 10 and like reflect. That's not going to be easy, bro. Especially when you're doing it with another human being who is also in a highly emotional state. It's not easy. But I think a big first step that would relieve a lot of suffering that a lot of people are enduring nowadays is to just realize that, yeah, our perceptions are not reliable at all. In fact, they are kind of deceptive and an asshole sometimes. So I've always said like, oh, perception is reality, perception is reality. Well, I finally made a video to be able to explain exactly what that meant. I really appreciate you guys for being here, for being a part of the Degenerate community. If you enjoyed this experience, this adventure that I brought you on, and you feel like more people would benefit from going on this adventure, if you liked and if you subscribed, it would help this experience reach other people. There's a lot more more exciting adventures that are going to come out and I'll see you in the next one. Love you guys.